speaking of uh, OJ and black people, uh, let's talk about Wu-Tang Clan. <laughs> speaking of prison break. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was the best segue I've ever heard in my entire life. Speaking of OJ. I knew he was black. <laughs> I knew he was black. 2%. All right. uh, yeah. So, yeah. I mean, Wu-Tang is like, Wu-Tang's for the children. I mean, that's just all there is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, you know, I, I was a rapper for a number of years. I okay. Still, I don't think you, I don't, I'm never going to stop being a rapper. I will always. I had no myself. idea that you were a rapper. Wait, did you, before today? Before today. Are you kidding? We never talked about it. No, that. we, t- we, it got mentioned. It got, but we didn't like dive into it. I don't think we dove I mean, into it. When we met you, we literally like divulged all, all, all of our souls. Like, oh my God, we love you. I'm going to tell you everything about me. And like, we did this. Yeah. We were just a whole, all yeah, of us. We went in. We did but go in. I missed that. That, that's that's the that's, that's thing that's a thing to miss yeah yeah wow. so yes yeah, so I, I was a rapper for a number of years I was always into hip hop from a very very young age I remember the first two uh, first two CDs I ever bought I was 13 years old I bought them from my neighbor's house at a garage sale was uh, Dr. Dre's The Chronic mm-hmm. and <laughs> Fresh Prince and Jazzy Jeff uh, Summertime wow like couldn't be further on the spectrum yeah. from each other of the two but like I, I wanted to be well rounded yeah I want to be well rounded so I got into that really early then I didn't really I wasn't really feeling West Coast rap and I, I mean I lived on the East Coast anyway so I wasn't really yeah. feeling that. So like Nas became a staple for me. What did yeah. Jay? Like Nas was a staple for me. And I remember being 16 years old with my mom. And because I went everywhere with her because I was the only child and a single mother. I remember her taking me to a, 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 a mammogram appointment. Mm-hmm. And I'm the little kid, well, six, 15, 16, uh, sitting in the, uh, in the lobby waiting for her. And I had the Nas, it was written CD. And in CDs back in the day, I'm sure y'all both remember. I hope you do, Courtney. That little so pamphlet that the, pulls out? The, yeah, not just the pamphlet. It's the pamphlet that has the lyrics. Yes. Remember some of the yes, lyrics? Yes, I remember. So I remember sitting there because I wanted to feel like a rapper. Yeah. And I would just rewrite his lyrics on paper just so I could feel yeah. what it felt like to write wow. rhymes. They weren't even mine. It's just like the muscle memory of like writing rhymes. And then I remember, and this is something that if either of you know this song, I will be thoroughly impressed because I've yet to hear anybody who knows it. There was a group called Blase Blase. And they had a song mm-hmm. called Danger. No. When the East is in the house. Oh my God, danger. Okay, so you don't remember. Nope. So that was the first instrumental I ever wrote to. I had a tape where on one side it was the track and on the other side it was the instrumental. Hell yeah. And I was writing, I was writing verses to that when I was 17. So I started rapping around like 16, 17. When I was 19-ish, I fell in with a crew that was already established that was actually making beats and like doing shows. I was just doing it like I had some idiot like friends that were just stoners and we would rap, you know, in, yeah. in houses and stuff. But this is a group that was really doing it. And so they brought me in. I was the only white kid. It was all black dudes. There was, one, yeah. there was one Palestinian dude uh, and, and all black dudes. And then it was me. And, uh, and they would mess with me all the time. Anytime. They were roasting your ass. <laughs> they would roast me so hard. If anything that had to do with anything black, yeah. they would get on me. So I'd be like, yo, I like that shirt, man. They're like, why? Because it's black. black. <laughs> yeah. like, no, I just, I just like the shirt. Just to fuck with you. Just to fuck with you, yeah. which was amazing. Uh, so, so we did that and we, we started doing shows like all over the place. And then we became like one of the staple groups in Orlando. So anytime a big act came into town, yeah. they would come to us and say, hey, do y'all want to open for so-and-so act? But they also didn't want a little Wu-Tang up there. There was like nine of us. Yeah. They didn't want a little Wu-Tang. So they would say, listen. Dang, nine? Oh my God. What was he called? What were you guys called? Par- P-Docs. Paradox Unit. That's tight. The P-Docs. P-Docs. Yeah, P-Docs unit. yeah, yeah. So, uh, so some people from, the, and they came from, they, a lot of them were family. They were cousins and brothers that came from Memphis and from Toronto and moved to Orlando. All of them ended up in Orlando together. And so they were, you know, they made beats and they were like incredible. And some of them are still making beats. One of them is a dude, uh, he goes by the name of I Make Mad Beats, all one word. Hi. And he wears a mask over his face and nobody ever sees what he actually looks like. He's such a dope producer. And his brother Czar. And they AKA just, Marshmallow. Yeah, <laughs> AKA Marshmallow. <laughs> and and so, we, so we started doing shows and stuff. And so when, when it was time to open up for an act, they would say, you know, y'all can open, but y'all can't all open, yeah. you know, so pick. So internally it would be like, you know, Twista came in and my boy Rugged and the, the Palestinian dude was yeah. like, I have to. Not actually Twista. Twista. Yeah, no. Oh shit. Yeah, this is like when the big acts would come into town. And oh, they, oh, 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 you're was, saying yeah. Twista came in. Yeah, okay, yeah, okay, got it, got it, got it, okay. So he would come in and then like we had, who else came in? Like Ja came in one okay. time, Ja Rule came in before he got- What's my motherfucking name? Yeah, that's, that, that, was, <laughs> that was what was big, yeah. Before he got completely obliterated for Woo. singing by 50, who then started singing and now we have Drake, so full circle. Yeah. Uh, so I don't know what happened there. And then, so yeah, these acts would come into town. So for me, like- was always a big thing for me. I was always a huge fan of Wu Tang, yeah. And so that was that was one of the ones that I got to do. And it was just, uh, yeah, it just emceeing and performing was such a big thing for me because also as a white kid, and this is kind of around Eminem time a, a little bit, uh, but as a white kid, like I noticed, and actually it wasn't just as a white kid. This is rap in general is one of the most has one of the most judgmental audiences in the world. Yeah, everybody in the crowd has their not everybody. A lot of people in the crowd have their arms crossed, like I could do that. 
Yeah. And so you feel that energy from the stage. You're like just trying to do your thing. And there's some people who are into it and like right. really, it. but then there's always like, I should be up on stage. Why am I not on stage? Right? Yeah. And so I started realizing very early on, if I want to feel any semblance of like love from the audience, I need to, and I didn't have the words to articulate it back then, but I know it now from the work I've done, is I need some way to lower their resistance to me being up here on stage. Yeah. And that's where I started injecting comedy into what I was doing. Hell yeah. So I would either be self-deprecating or I would just yeah. like, make jokes or whatever. I'd it like, seems like that's what Eminem would do too. Totally. And like, Little Dicky. To- I mean, totally. you know what I'm saying? Totally. Little yeah. Dicky was a marketer, by the way, before he became a rapper. Yeah. yeah he oh, really? A, he was in marketing. Same wow. with uh, Hoodie, Hoodie Allen. He used to work for Google. Really? Yeah. And then he became a rapper. He was like marketing for Google. That is cr- and That's I don't know funny. You know, and we were talking about Jay Shetty before. Jay yeah. Shetty, who everybody thinks is like just this monk that came out of nowhere and went viral. He worked for Accenture, one of okay. the biggest consulting companies in the world, helping like 400 executives manage their social media presence. Wow. So he is smart. Like, there are people that are smart. They have real skills that come yeah. and then they layer their talent on top. And for Dickie, Dickie wanted to be a comedian. He didn't want to be a rapper. Yeah. He was using rap as a vehicle to be a comedian. Yeah. And he realized he's actually a fucking really He's actually, guy. have you seen Dave? Of course. Yeah, both seasons. I love it. He is, the, the freestyle he does at the end of season one yeah. where he's like walking around the studio like inside the studio and oh like, yeah when uh, he was with another rapper who was the rapper YG um, YG. It was YG YG yeah 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 yo <laughs> that shit was good yo and, and even and you've seen the video for Save That Money um, yes. I don't think I have. This is the one where he makes the rap video without spending any money. He wants to do it all. Oh, right, 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 right. So, but that video alone is such a lesson in creativity and resourcefulness. Like to me, Dickie is a genius. Yeah. Uh, and and so, but it, so that's what I figured out was being on stage and having some comedy. If if I have you laughing either at me or with me, I don't really care. Then when I do my whole rap thing, they're like, all right, he's fine. He, it's okay. He's funny. He's, he's okay. Yeah, I'll, I'll he's chill. Go. I'll let it go. And that's, and that's what I brought into the whole personal growth thing. Because I think personal growth and self-help gets really fucking serious sometimes. Yeah. yeah. So if you totally. bring the comedy element in, I call it instead of self-help, I call it stealth help. Yeah. Right? Because it's kind of like under the radar. Like you're being entertained, you're having fun. And without you even knowing it, you're like better in your life. So yeah. for me, that was a big, a big thing to get over people feeling resistance to me as a rapper, which is bringing some comedy in. That's where it started. Perfect. Yeah. yeah. It's kind of like- if you come at it with, I'm an expert and I know more than you and I'm better than you, then they're going to have resistance versus Absolutely. like, yeah. no, maybe I just have a different perspective than you or whatever it is. But it's interesting you bring up Lil Dicky because we did a show with him, uh, I want to say 2017 no way. in Milwaukee. And it was, it was some radio show. So he played, played right before us. It was, it was Lil Dicky, us, and then the Chainsmokers. Okay. Or I think it was... I don't know, whatever. I don't remember the order. He played his last- I la- remember that order. That's important. It's very important. <laughs> very important. You better correct your shit. You better make sure. Your story just went to hell. Yeah, I'm just saying, though. You better make sure. <laughs> I think it was Lil Dicky, the Chainsmokers, and then us. That's right. That's how. Yeah, that's, that's right, boo. Up. That's what's up. Which actually fucked us up because <laughs> people started leaving. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't. It wasn't actually good. I mean, but still, though. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Lil Dicky played his last song. He played "Let Me Freak." I don't know if you guys are familiar with that song. Let me let freak. Me freak. God damn it, let me freak. Anyway. Like, let me fuck, but like, let me freak. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wow. takes off his pants. He's wearing whitey tidies. He brings a girl on stage. He kind of dances on him. It's like his whole his whole gig. It's it's amazing. It's genius. Yeah. So we're our green room's right next to each other. I'm like, all right, I'm going to go, you know, it's chill. We're both artists playing this. I'm going to go say what up to him, whatever. I go into his green room. He just got off stage. He's still in his whitey tidies. Wow. I'm just like, what up? <laughs> Little Dicky, uh, just want to say what up. Uh, good to meet you. And he's like, yeah, man, like so nice. You know, just completely not acknowledging that he's in whitey tidies. So needless to say, I kind of got out of there pretty quick. But yeah, uh, but that level, that level of degaff is like, I really, yeah, he I does not that. give a fuck. I want that for myself. Yeah. I, I want that level of degaff. Yeah. I don't have it. Yeah. I don't have it yet. Yeah. I still give a lot of fucks. Yeah. 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 I get that. Maybe one day. 